Welcome to episode two of This Catholic Life. Conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical, and joyful. That's going to be a challenge today because today's show is called You Give Love a Bad Name, which is about those Catholics and things, the events and news which would give us a bad name. That is not just Catholics, but Christians in general, and in particular, the institutional church in Australia. I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and today I'm joined by Renee Cole ryan Professor in Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. Hello, Hi, Renee. Hi, Peter. And by Cormac McCann, who's making his debut as a co-host here on This Catholic Life. Hello, Cormac. Hello, a very risky move by you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is designed to be a series of conversations on how we deal with everyday life, but still manage to maintain our Christian identity, What and mostly a discussion of what that actually means, what our Christian identity is. We aim to chat about uh, how each of us manage to muddle through everyday life and achieve joy through this Catholic life. Joy, I don't mean giggling sort of pretense at happiness, but genuine deep satisfaction and sense of purpose in what we do and a fulfillment in that sense. Uh, This topic is not lending itself, though, to happy conversations because it's about who who gives us a bad name. Perhaps we should have another show on who gives us a good name, (laughs) but hopefully that'll come up as we discuss this. Before we get stuck into the conversation, let's talk about this week. My week's been pretty crazy, getting lessons ready for semester two, particularly the marriage and sexuality class, which is going to be some of the things we touch on in the show today. Cormac, how's your week been? Yeah, it's been pretty good. Uh, my wife and I are actually in the process of securing our first home, which is really exciting Ooh. and terrifying. Yes. Uh, there's a, a steep learning curve in terms of you know loans and paperwork and negotiations and strategies. And, yep. and that kind of all fell on my shoulders because my wife was very beautiful and said, Cormac, I delegate this all to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's been the wonderful. The secret of a happy marriage, that's delegation. Right, that's right. I'm learning this slowly, <laughs> she says, and I do. I have been at my desk all this last week having a wonderful time putting together an online program, um, which is the human person in Catholic thought, and I had my mm. first online classroom this last week. I was a little bit nervous about it, but we had a great time. Talking you can just with pretend teachers. you're on a podcast. I know. It was, it was probably good training, the, the earlier podcasts. So I had teachers from across New South Wales talking about wonderful things, um, which I might get back to with our moment of wonder later on. Indeed. Let's dive right in then to the hard issues. Today's topic is You Give Love a Bad Name, not the Bon Jovi song, although I would have killed <laughs> to have the rights to, <laughs> to play that as our intro today. Um, but what it is that give Christians a bad reputation in the world? What it is that puts people off about Christians? What are the things we say, do, or don't do that make people suspicious, skeptical, or even downright mad with us? And it's becoming much more evident, I've noticed, in response to lots of public things lately, the hostility towards the church. Which, and people who've not actually met an active Christian recently or something, they feel that there's a, an outright hostility towards things Catholic in particular. It seems to be that Catholics is a brand, if you like, that they recognise as the, the bad guys. Um, we're going to talk about the things in the media, public scandals, church leaders, right down to things in the local parish. But let's start with the big obvious elephant in the room, the public scandals, because that's what is in everyone's face. It's very much what people are talking about, particularly in relation to Catholicism. You can't go past the sexual abuse scandals as... The, the biggest thing that it, it gets waved in our face as soon as we talk. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but any time I'm talking to people who aren't Catholics, almost always you can count on a counter comment in Facebook or in conversation, people will drop a, a, a nasty comment about child molestation and about this being the worst institution in the world for all these sorts of things. Is that your experience? It actually isn't. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we. Are, it's interesting. It's. I uh, want to meet your friends. Yeah, well, yeah, very, very <laughs> fortunate Catholic. in the circles I, I, I mix in. No, I, I've had a number of really interesting encounters with. Uh, uh, in my actual, my previous job, I worked for the New South Wales government, and uh, it was always a, a really interesting uh, point of engagement where you, the definitely not a not a practicing community in any right. terms of, uh, of faith, but. Interestingly, uh, I used to take my rosary beads uh, right. to, to work every day, do like the rosary on the bus, uh, and then I would leave them at my desk sometimes. I would just forget. Sure. And I remember coming to work right, one morning and I'd found the, the rosary beads had been moved, <laughs> moved from, from my computer, from my work desk, and moved to the center of the meeting room 
on a table <laughs> spread out. And you imagine these just big rosary beads just sitting there on the table, the beautiful rose color, very, very lovely. And you could just imagine just a group of people just standing around like a bunch of seagulls eyeing off a chip or something like going, <laughs> what on earth is this? And who's going to pick it up? And this what's religious relic. That's right. And so, and, but that was actually a, a starting point of a conversation with a number of them who, who then came up and said, look, we noticed this. What is it? What's mm. it all about? And there was, there was a polite curiosity. And I've, yep. I, I think that's how I would describe most of the encounters that I've had. Some people may know a few things uh, from the media and things like that, but I'd say that the realm of social media and the realm of actual human experience engaging with people one-on-one are, are very disparate in terms of their attitudes yeah, towards the church. Um, would you, so you've had, obviously, secular people and, uh, and others interacting. What about you, Renee? Have you had? Um, mainly, I suppose, my... My life these days is fairly Catholic. (laughs) Um, So most of the students that I have would be Catholic uh, and some are are not Catholic. And and some of them are really openly curious, I think, in the way that you're talking about Cormac, which is is nice. I think there might be some advantages to being in a so-called post-Christian age. Right. What what do you mean by that? Sorry. Because there's a lot of talk these days about the fact that we've gone through a kind of, um, you know, an age of Christendom, then an age of secularism where people kind of still knew what Christianity was, but they were really turning against it. And now I think we're actually at a point where people don't even know what Christianity is anymore. Right. But yeah. that becomes a new opportunity to start explaining to ourselves. Because first it's a blank of all. slate. Yeah. So, so it's like I, I think of um, our era now as very much like Augustine's era where we're looking at the pagans again mm. and mm. we love them and we want to – Show them, and, and we can be very pagan ourselves too. Let's not forget that. Mm. But let's uh, let's just you know renew the understanding of what it means to be Christian, yep. what it means to be in Christ. It's a huge challenge, it's interesting you but say it's that. quite exciting because the pagan thing is a. I mean, pa- no, they're not really pagan in the proper sense of the, the the ancient idea of pagan, but in the sense of being in non-religious. many ways they are. Okay, yeah, I think New Ageism is basically paganism, and yeah, lots okay. of people are mm. a new agey these days, and Go they don't the realize. Just, yeah, you'll see. Yeah, you'll see this. okay. Yeah, and and just people who just as a matter of course are going into Buddhist meditation and mm. yoga because that's the thing you do. That's pa- paganism. I'm I mean, spiritual right. but not you know, religious. Yeah, kind of that's mentality. right. Okay. Um, yeah, so I I think that that's actually a huge opportunity for us in many ways. There's probably more openness now. Particularly in, I'm looking at the young man to my right here in your generation comic, but also in the others, sort of high schoolers now, um, who are curious about the interesting things that go on in Christianity. I I get an impression, um, Renee, that you're absolutely right. The when I'm talking to people who haven't had an experience of church, you're really dealing with a blank slate, except mm. for the image they've got via the media and, and right. other things yeah. like that, and. But the, on the other hand, sometimes we as Christians act and and think as if it's still a Christian culture, mm. as if we're surprised that certain things happen in parliament or in schools or things like that because we, we're sort of half expecting everything to be Christian still. And I think we're long beyond that. Oh, I'm Christian. astonished that anything is Christian anymore. Right. So I'm coming from the opposite extreme. It's like any little bit in there is amazing right. because I think that the whole fabric of what it actually means to be Christian has been so corroded that we it's amazing if anything gets through it's through the <laughs> grace of god and the work of a lot of really good people that anything remains so i'm coming from the opposite extreme i'm having yeah. this discussion with you and a friend of mine who we we argue about who's an optimist and who's a pessimist and i now know why no Renee's, i'm a realist yeah renee's <laughs> renee's always very cheerful and now i know why because anything she sees is a plus wow yeah, that's right. oh my gosh that <laughs> works not killing that's each amazing. other today that's, that's amazing right. yeah. um we come back to the actual uh, public persona uh, presentation though of the faith. And I have to say that um, uh, when we're talking about things like religious freedom, I was standing on the sideline of my son's soccer game, talking to other mums and dads, very good people. Like we've really enjoyed their company over a long period of time, a couple of years now. And yet when the issue came up um, about religious freedom, absolutely straight out the bat, no, all Catholics should be silenced. They should actually outlaw Catholicism. It's a perverse and corrupting institution. It's basically harming all these kids and that's all it's good for and there's no good they've ever done. It was so absolute mm. across the board wow. in these people, so violently anti-Catholic. And I was attempting very gently to say, well, hang on, maybe there's some people who aren't quite that bad and and it, it just simply wasn't accepted. So I've I've had a similar experience from people and I, I play on online communities, so I come across lots of people, various views, various stages of life, various identifications in terms of sexuality 
and they're all they usually have an idea of Catholicism that they're reacting to, mm. like a, a perception of it. And I have to say that it hasn't helped the public image of Catholicism that we have actually verified court, you know, court cases that have yep. found guilty, um, you know, priests, bishops, um, and I think more insidiously, institutional cover-ups. I think yep. that's actually, I mean, people do bad things and that's horrible. It should never happen. But mm. the fact that an institution where, where people in the institution who weren't afflicted by this particular perversion, who weren't afflicted by that particular, you know, d- you know, sort of irrational urge to hurt someone, but they covered that up and they actually harmed the victims even worse and, you know, prevented recovery for these victims because they denied the situation. That makes me, it makes my blood boil. You mentioned before I look angry at the start of this podcast. I am angry <laughs> because I have children. And some yeah. of my non-Catholic friends look at me and say, uh, how can you do this? You know, you, how can you defend the church? I'm not defending the church on this. This is abysmal. This <laughs> I do think that there there needs to be a distinction made, though, and and probably that's something that as a Catholic I've come to realise more and more. There's the institutional church, yes, which I tend to think has become very, very bureaucratic, yes, and so it's taken on all of the ways that the modern state can really indeed um, swallow up individuals and not listen to them and just cover up everything and legalise everything. And, and I think institutions that that is tend shameful. to defend themselves. Don't that's they? right, and so there's that. But then there is the church that is the broken, wounded body of Christ. Yes. Um, and actually unifying ourselves with Christ in that respect is a, is a huge challenge when the institutional face of the church, which everyone identifies as the church. Yes. So everyone thinks, oh, the church is St. Peter's and your archdiocese and offices and your schools and your hospitals and everything else. But as a Catholic, if you realize that, no, that's not the only aspect of the yep. church, it becomes even more of a challenge to find one's place as a Catholic. So should we ditch the Pope and the bishops and all that? Absolutely not, because that's part of the sacramental reality. So that's part of the living presence of Christ in the world. But again, it's a broken living presence of Christ in the world. This seems to be the big point, isn't it? The the, the fact that the problem seems to have been that people were either perpetuating or they bought an image of church as being a perfect ideal. Yeah. That if, if there's any sort of blip in the radar that says Catholics, the, the priest or the or the hierarchy or any part of the church was not pure or not good in, in real life, that they kind of, oh, shh, shh we've got to keep the image up. Whereas, yeah. in fact, if we had a full understanding of the church being a broken place, yeah. we could perhaps own that brokenness and go, right, now it's broken, let's bring yeah. healing to that situation. Or if we actually just stopped talking about the church as though it was this perfect thing and talked about the church as the, as the bride of Christ who was always trying to um, overcome all of the obstacles of yeah. original sin through living through um, and with Christ. I yeah. think that G.K. G.K. Chesson, yeah. sorry, go on. No, no, but even getting that down to the personal level, you talk of this attitude of the church as institution as supposedly perfect and that's the attitude people have. I think sometimes Catholics can have that unrealistic expectation on themselves at yes. an individual level. Yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I've done the wrong thing. Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm wicked a person. How can I failure. possibly yeah. like yep. recover from this at all? And I think that I don't know that that really negative mindset of the self as needing to attain perfection all the time yeah. or yeah. You know, meet that expectation is also problematic. Especially in the young Catholics who who have sort of gone countercultural against society and they've gone, no, I'm going to reject that whole pagan thing or whatever it is, and and become you know really take my religion seriously. And they get into it and they're so passionate about it. Then when they fall. Like even in a small way, they suddenly go, oh, and there's a identity crisis. Am I really good enough Catholic? And I, and then the, they almost repeat the institutional problem, which is that they try and cover up the the, the flaws mm. rather than actually confront them and deal yeah. with them. We have to say though that um, not just the actual flaws and the actual perceptions of the problem here. We have out there quite established situations where the church has fundamentally failed to protect the people in the, in the in the institution. That has to be, if you like, put on the table in all its ugliness and faced and dealt with. We have to bleed that out, if, if I can put it that way. I think, And honestly, we, any attempt to defend institutions and say, we're not quite as bad. I, at one stage, I went into all the stats and Catholic church is much less per capita than other churches. It's much less per capita than the scouts and all that sort of thing. And you go, well, doesn't matter. You know, it we're shouldn't be to... happening at all. No, zero. So, zero is the acceptable, zero is right. the acceptable thing. <laughs> we, yeah, d- we just yeah. don't want to go there at all. We, yeah. we cannot use excuses. And the two quo queer argument, you know, you, you're doing it too. That's not good enough. No. Yeah. It's not good enough. We And we have to look at ourselves first and go, this guy 
has to change. And and the, the way we deal with institutions, and we can't be making excuses for this ever. Um, and in a sense, um, what frustrates me about this is that people have, um, if you like, put solutions out there which aren't necessarily solutions for the problem. It seems to me that all the people arguing about clericism, about having married priests, about all these kinds of solutions to this are exact. I've actually gone back through my emails. They're exactly the same people who were saying the same things before the crisis hit many, many years ago. And they've a new, you know, this new crisis is if smashed into the world, and they're using it as a catalyst for their own political agenda. Mm. What that annoys me about that is it doesn't respect the victims themselves because they're not actually interested in helping the victims. They're using the momentum of it to to push a particular agenda, uh, because all the stats say, by the way, that married priests doesn't actually um, affect the abuse. In fact, it it's a slightly higher rate of sexual misconduct among married clergy in the world than Catholic priests. Sorry, than celibate priests. That doesn't, it's not a good argument for one thing or another, but I'm just saying, I think that using the victims as a as a means of political capital is a really dangerous thing. You're seeing it in parliament a little bit because the voice of Catholicism has been against things like euthanasia and, and other things in parliament and they use the whole, you, you watch someone try and stand up and say something about euthanasia now, the, the pedophilia put down for anyone who's a Catholic comes out and it's totally irrelevant to the argument, but it gets used as a put down. It doesn't respect the victims. We actually need to be helping the victims. But that's the new world of social capital, right? You know, the church has really lost its ground yes. on that, that natural respect uh, that it used to Yeah, it's that, that capital of trust, right? Yeah, The Catholic right. Church is important not the trusted word. organization. Yeah, important word, trust, mm. because it used to be that people, even if they weren't Catholic, they at least expected a certain level of behavior from a priest. Yeah. And mm. nowadays it's almost the opposite. Yeah. They almost expect or believe in advance accusations against a priest or, or someone who's a public Catholic figure. Um, well, let's not dwell on this too much, but I, I, let me throw the clericism thing out there. Is there a perception that um, clerics, uh, by that we mean priests and bishops, and uh, that they have, um, what, what is clericism? I mean, well, how would we define it? That they have an undue influence, that they... I mean, they have an influence. That they can mm. do no wrong. They can do no wrong. <laughs> so putting <laughs> they, on a pedestal. They are the authority figures on everything and yep. anything mm. that they say goes because yep. they are the authority figures. And I think that that has been. Yeah. I've certainly seen that um, as a huge problem. I just read yesterday an open letter written by a victim over in the US and it was, it was an awful read, but she basically named all of the clerics who had failed her. Yes. And she said exactly in which ways they had. So it was an awful thing so to some read. Of those but were. it was, And some of those were, well, you abused me, you covered it up, you told me it was my fault. These are all people, different, different people. Different people, yeah. Yeah, different people. Um, you told me that all of this was going to be resolved and yep. that the person who had done this to me would be made responsible for it. That didn't happen. Not only did it not happen, but I know that this person went on to abuse others. Yes. And nothing mm. was done about that. I know that some of those have come forth, but yep. some of them have not because they've been frightened to seeing what happened to me yes. when mm. I tried to do and and it's ruined my life. Yes. So um and basically that letter really I think brought to the fore what you're asking about with um clericism or clericalism, which is that she trusted in the institutional presence of yes. the cleric and thought that that was the safe place to go and it was the most unsafe place possible yes. to go. And Although then the question have becomes, been the safe it should place. have been the safest yeah. place, and then the question becomes, well, where is she supposed to go? Yes. And there is nowhere for her to go because people aren't listening to her. her. Yep. And I think the other side of clericalism is, um, and, you, and this has come up in the abuse cases within Australia, so 40 or 50 years ago, young child comes home, says, mum, this is what happens. It happened. And the mum says, well, no, father never would have done that. Yep. You bad boy, um, you're lying. What a horrible, horrible, yes, horrible right. situation. Um, so, yeah, I think that it is, a, it's a huge problem. It has been a huge problem. Hopefully, it's one that we're overcoming. Well, I mean, certainly the steps are in the right direction, but you still, I mean, we're still seeing a recalcitrance in terms of in terms of actually making the right steps. In some respects, we've gone a little bit too far, and I think institutional solutions are not going to solve the problems that institutions. That was gone. I wanted to ask. Yeah. Like, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. what do we do about it? And what's the but because is it the root cause of the problem? I mean, having. The, Having a workshop that says how you deal with children helps a good person be a good person, right? Having a workshop on how to behave around children doesn't stop someone who has bad urges and bad 
bad decision making and, and bad moral problems. It doesn't stop them. It just enables them to get around those problems. However, what it can do is set up an institutional response, which is a bit more well, awake to the to the problems and and actually more likely to take seriously the um, the victims. Uh, I hope so, anyway. And I've yeah. seen I've seen it happen, and I think that we're getting there. We're certainly the Catholic Church are leading the way in, the, in these kinds of solutions. There's certainly um, up there with some of the best in the world at the moment, but we're still, I mean, this has taken years, like decades to come out, the problems have. So I think we're going to wait, have to wait decades to see the solutions. But Catholics aren't the only ones um, causing us a bad name. And often if people aren't Christian at all, if they've had no experience, they'll often look at anyone who identifies as a Christian and kind of lump that in the same basket. So what about other people who say that they're Christian and um, give us a bad name? Can you think of any examples? Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we went there. That's yeah, good. That's right. Now, there are some Christians, let's be fair, there are some Christians who would say he's the saviour, not the saviour, but he's a saviour because they seem as the the answer to the kind of anti-life, anti, um, anti-specifically anti religious freedom in the States. So if you've mentioned Donald Trump as a possible. Well, absolutely. I just think that he's used in the media as a way of further entrenching that image of anyone who's publicly professes Christianity in whatever level of belief, yep. regardless of, you know, public practice or whatever, um, proposes to be pro-life, anti-euthanasia, right. things like that. And you go, well, okay, well, this is the best public candidate you've got, you know, yep. and he's tarnished in the media every other day. It's just kind of, <laughs> yeah, I've saw, just picked it as an example. Of I something. saw a meme on, on when they were having the gay marriage debate um, in, in the States and the, the, um, the meme said, I'm sorry that my gay marriage undermines your fourth marriage. <laughs> um, in terms of that, it was a meme about Donald Trump. Yeah. Yes. In other words, if you're going to espouse something, it helps to have actually lived lived that thing. That's right. The character matters of the individual. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's why I brought him up. I actually think Donald Trump's problem goes a little bit further than that. I mm. think that he's claiming a religious sort of underpinning to his ideas. And some of the ideas that he's pushing quite hard are profoundly anti-Christian, I think. The treatment of um, people coming across, you know, re genuine refugees, the treatment of people who have been in the States for a long time but just don't have the right kind of heritage or, or you know, colour or whatever. And the encouragement of that particular kind of behaviour, I think, is profoundly unchristian and should not be given a Christian label, if you like. Mm. Um, however, I mean, and again, the, the situation is not black and white. And that's the trouble, I think, with modern ideas that you put one person up and say, this is the Christian candidate, almost never works because it's not going to. I mean, our recent election, yeah. some people were saying one side's the Christian one and the other side. And then I heard both arguments coming from different yeah. places. It's very difficult to vote as a Catholic, but I think that that's probably where we're always stuck, right? Whenever I do one of those, the ABC online, where do you sit and who should you be voting for? I'm always the centre. So if yeah. I want to <laughs> go for the social issues, it's going to be more the Liberal Party. But even until recently, I was not very happy with what was going on there. No. And I certainly wasn't happy with what was going on with Labor, but I'm probably more Labor economically, but always mm. right at the centre. So it becomes really, really tricky to figure out what yeah, to do. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I, I wrote a post actually, Dear Labor, after the election, and um, I basically said, please stop deliberately targeting Christians and having a go at our religious freedoms and having a go at these social issues because I'd really love to get on board with some of your other ideas yeah. mm. in terms of you know, the minimum wage and the, and the treatment of the, the, the vulnerable and the, all of those kinds of things. But it's really hard because as soon as I step into your fray, you're basically saying, you're unwelcome, you get out of here because we mm. don't like your retrograde views. And and if you're going, not going to be a broader church and, and at least permit that sort of voice, you've basically written a whole bunch of people off. I'm not terribly happy with where the Liberal Party's dealing with either. But I think, Renee, what you said before is very important, that it should be agony to vote because when someone says it's an easy choice, mm. I think you're not really thinking about this. Yeah. You haven't really thought through all of the, the big issues here because none of them are worthy of an unquestioned a Christian vote, in my opinion. What about televangelists and people who present themselves quite clearly as being, you know, the pristine kind of schmick um, Christians on telly, usually asking for money of some kind? Hmm. I must admit to not having had too <laughs> much... Um, truck with televangelists, probably because they don't have television. 
That, that would, that would be, be it. Yeah. <laughs> a valid reason. <laughs> All right, so I asked the wrong person. <laughs> That's right. Comic, over to you. Well, you must have television. Even more limited yeah. experience. It's <laughs> like, you know, when you're chasing toddlers around the place, if the, the only sacred time that you'll get for the, you know, the devil's altar, as Fulton Sheen calls it, the, the, the TV, <laughs> is hopefully Friday night footy. So, but the Sunday right. morning televangelists, however, I've, uh, I'd... I have sat and watched a few episodes of some of them, and I, I, I can't or won't name any particular examples. However, I, I do get the general uh, sense of this kind of notion of the prosperity gospel. Yeah. This idea that we're, we're sending a message out that your life is, is difficult, life is suffering, life is trouble, but if we look to this particular verse of Scripture, yep. you can see that you can apply this directly to your life and something's going to happen yeah. in the near future. You don't know when, but God is going to, I remember this phrase, he's going to shoot you out because it was some reference to a bow and arrow or right. something in, yeah. in the Old Testament. It's like, and it's going to happen and you're all, and everyone's there and they're getting on their feet. Now, I, yep. may, I don't know, maybe it'll happen, but there's no such promise in Scripture that you'll suddenly be prosperous, but it's a very attractive message if you're saying <laughs> to someone, right. your life is crap, here's Here's a, here's a way that it's going to become instantly better if you become Christian. And that's not a new thing. It's been happening for some time. If you do this, we, you know, the payoff will be that. Um, some time ago now, but there was a movie um, called Leap of Faith with Steve Martin in it. And he, he actually modeled his character in that movie. He was a televangelist in the movie, Con Man. And he modeled it on a, a televangelist who's still on television today. It's worth going to look at the movie because right. it actually he does a really good job of sort of showing the glitz and glam and then – in the movie, he has an encounter with an actual spiritual experience, and it's quite it's quite an interesting movie. Um, the what about other Christians like sportsmen? Um, uh, I'll throw the name Israel Folau in there. We're going to be talking about religious freedom in a in another episode, but uh, the fact that he came out and said this particular meme that he threw around, uh, which seemed to send quite a lot of people, not just homosexuals, but quite a lot of other people, fornicators, liars. Well, there's a whole list from Book of Revelation. Drunkards, things like Drunkards, yes, yes. And which covers most of his team, I would suggest. <laughs> <laughs> now, now. But, well, this is what amused me at, at the start is that I thought, well, hang on, how is it that only homosexuality is getting pinned out of this whole list when, in fact, there's quite a long list in this thing and every, all the others seem comfortable with this criticism? But an atheist friend of mine said, um, Peter, it's different uh, because none of those people would say that drunkenness or adultery or idolatry, only those things, none of them would say they're good things, whereas they would say in modern society that homosexuality is okay, that it's good, it's not a sin in itself, whereas all the others most people would recognise and go, yeah, okay, it's not great to be drunk, it's not great to be a liar, it's not great to be a cheat. Mm. I'd even go further. I think that it's actually that um, with all of these issues of sexual identity, with whether it be homosexuality or transgender, I know that they're very different from each other, actually. Mm. But um, they've been recognised as the vulnerable group. Yes. And if you see the church as actually victimising vulnerable populations, mm, yes. yep. then they just become the next vulnerable population that the Catholics are persecuting. Well, in, in fairness, oh, and the Christians are persecuting. In fairness, fairness all the stats in terms of um, mental health and and you know all the negative outcomes to do with life and and victimisation measure up to say these communities do suffer a great deal and, and, and mm. it's a, the jury's out on who's actually causing the suffering but there is definitely they are in fact vulnerable there's no right. there's no doubt yeah, about right. it and, and there is a, a genuineness and just throwing a, an accusation at someone even if you justify it by saying it's a bible verse is not a terribly good thing i was saying to renee yeah. the other day cormac that if i had have spouted that line in my classroom at Notre Dame, Renee might have had a conversation with me to say, mm, maybe this isn't the way to, be, the best way to go about <laughs> well, this. Well, interestingly, in the Australian, I think a, a little while ago, Greg Sheridan made the point that um, the the terminology. So, so Israel Folau apparently took a, a passage from Saint one of Saint Paul's letters and just kind of transcribed it into everyday speak. But the yep. term homosexuality actually refers to. Everything else refers to a practice. It's something mm -hmm. you do. You go and you get drunk. You you fornicate. You lie and everything else. Whereas yes. homosexuality is something. It's same sex attraction. So that's actually a different kind of thing. It's not and the it's action. Not, it's, it's not the, an accurate translation of the word. No, either. no. So there are all sorts of issues with the tweet right. in itself. Um, yeah. And I think that that was a really. I thought that that was a really astute yeah. point. So it was an yeah. identi identity thing rather than an action. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. fair enough. Yeah, yeah that's because we point. all sin. And we all do the wrong thing. Um, and yeah, you know, 
Peter Singer came out and said, you know, according to Israel Falau, this was this was an interesting moment in in public discourse in Australia. So Peter Singer um, said, well, if you look at what Israel Falau believes, then he was exactly right. So this is Peter Singer with his perfect logic. He was <laughs> absolutely logically correct to say, I want to warn these people that they will go to hell because this is what I think. So yes. this is my act of love, if you will, yeah. um, to these people. And that's where I see it coming from. And that's where it becomes more mm. of a religious freedom issue. If I could sit down with Israel, I'd probably say to him, talk about it, how effective it is, because I've never heard of anybody changing their mind from being abused or being told that yeah. they were wrong or something. So, I mean, if you if you see someone who's suffering, I have a, a dear friend who was an alcoholic, and if you say to them, alcohol's ruining your life. It's not very helpful. You know, it's not right. very helpful. Either they're yeah. going to deny it or or they're going to say, yeah, well, so what? You, you've got to actually provide an alternative. Yeah. Or you, and so what do you say to someone who has genuine same-sex attraction? This isn't something they invent. No. We've got to have something more to say. We've got to actually have, first of all, we've got to listen for a very long yeah. time and understand the vulnerability and actually respond in kind. Um, so in other words, it can be about impression. Now, we, Renee and I have both experienced people who are very keen, young Catholics, especially young Catholics and, and um, of various ethnicities, who, who are very keen to get out there and save souls, but what they actually mean is win arguments. Yeah. And they get, yeah. <laughs> and this yeah. is bringing it down to a more local level. And, mm. and when I became a Catholic, I was often asked to go on um, into debates with Baptist ministers or, you know, Anglican ministers or whatever. And I always said no, because I've never met anyone who's gone to one of these debates and changed their mind or who felt that they received some edif edifying benefit from that debate. Now, apologetics has a place, but it's not evangelization. And I don't think that we, I don't think we win everyone, anyone over. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, I, I, and I think there's definitely, there's certainly among younger people, there's a, a certainly younger practicing Catholics, people are trying to work out, well, how do I, you know, there's, there's a, a, a zeal to really contribute to, to the yep. to the life of the church and they want to be involved and they want to be active in their parish. Yep. They want to do good <laughs> things. You know, they, you know, they want a particular kind of liturgy perhaps. Yep. Um, but there's, when it comes down to the, the practical thing about what do you do to reach out to people who are either yeah. sitting on the fence or vehemently against what you believe, how yeah. do you, how do you engage with them? And I can see there's a real split uh, among different uh, youth groups, for example, yep. where some think, no, no, you've got to smash them hard. You know, you, we're going to win this argument and that's how you convert. It worked in the Crusades. We can work again. Yeah, kind of. it yeah, worked yeah. so well then. They, have, they haven't actually looked at the history. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A little bit of history might help there. I, yeah. I used to have one student who would come up to me and say, give me the silver bullet argument, Professor. Give me the mm. silver bullet. And I'd say, there is no silver bullet. Mm. You have to live your life in a really good way and look for the arguments that make sense of what, yes. what's going on in your life. But there is no silver bullet yep. that you could just, you know, shoot this argument to someone, they'd say, oh, my gosh, you're totally right. Yes. There's, a, there's a whole lot more to the way yeah. that we actually respond to things in the world. And that's about being human because each individual human is an incredibly complex set of experiences and, and background education and all those sorts of things. We have to actually listen to someone for quite some time before we learn their language and we can actually firstly hear their hurts and their and their dreams and their hopes and all those sorts of things and then perhaps we can add some something of a perspective from our experience um, which might help them along the journey. And also the, the one-shot argument which converts someone is, is not a very Catholic concept. No. It, it, no, no, it, no. It's always a journey getting getting to the end, and we can help people in that journey. Yeah, I can share one brief story about yep. that, actually, if you like, where what a, back in the back in the government, I remember there was this, this one woman, let's, let's call, her, call her Joanna for argument's sake, and she was, you know, in her perhaps late 40s, early 50s, divorced and turned up to work at nine, went home at 4.30 and, and that was all she wanted. She right. wasn't really interested in doing anything, you know, advancing anywhere. Yep. And she, it was as if someone had stapled, you know, her, her lips downwards. Right. So she was in a perpetual frown. Like right. that was always, and, and so and I always used to be curious about that. So I made it my mission every single morning to go up and, you know, and make Joanna <laughs> laugh. That was my goal. I just, I just make a smile, make a laugh, say something ridiculous or do whatever. And I, and I did this every day. And after a few weeks, perhaps a month or two, she just stopped me one morning and said, Cormac, why are you so happy? <laughs> what do you take every morning? <laughs> Where Tell can I get some? Right. <laughs> that was the silver bullet. But right? no, but but then, but then I explain. Oh, well, you know, there's life's awesome. I've got yeah. a lot to to be grateful for, a lot to look forward to. Yep. Uh, and she's like, well, how, why do you think that? You know, isn't uh, isn't like property really expensive? How are young people supposed to survive in this world? You know, yes. what's going on? And I was like, oh no, I'm I'm really hopeful. I, I'm not really attached to 
owning stuff because I know I'm going to die one day and, and you know, what's going to count is what I've done. Yes. You know, and so I try and, uh, you know, I just said, said words to that effect essentially and you just saw something switch in her mind, uh, yep. you know, like, like a light just turned on. And I remember after that moment, every other day, she was just bouncier. She, mm. she came in, she, she engaged more. She was, yeah, something had some, I, I can't say what it was or whether it was actually even directly related to, to what I did at all, but yep. you certainly noticed there's a definite transformation and we've had a few really interesting conversations since then. And so, you Good. know, yeah, but that's, but that's the kind of thing that I think is really what sets, what should set, I think, Catholics, especially young Catholics who are looking for what we're supposed to be doing in the world, you know, how yeah. we're supposed to convert people, man, just be joyful. Yes. Be joyful, be excited. Joy, joy is a big deal. And, and, mm. and when I did a bit of a study about how kids, how parents retain their kids in the faith, um, I found out firstly, it's about the kids, not about the parents necessarily. But one of the, the common themes that came through wasn't their fidelity or their religious practice, but it was their joy. Mm. If they had joy in the faith, if there was joy in the home, the kids then associated all of the religious practice and, and the understandings as lived experience rather than just these are the principles and but look at what what it was like really. It was just strict or, or boring or you know too too um restrictive or something. But if there's joy, it actually you know keeps people interested. And and if people look at joy, I think World Youth Day was a good example of that in Sydney. People mm -hmm. looking around going, wow. Uh, all the things we thought about religion and all these religious people coming to town. I was in Denver and a, a Muslim cab driver picked me up to take me to the diocese and I said I was going to the Catholic um, headquarters and he said, oh, yeah, Catholics, uh, there was a, a bunch of them in town some years ago because <laughs> <laughs> he remembered Denver, World, Youth, World Day, Youth Day that yeah. there were all these happy young people and he couldn't yeah. get over the fact that they were all happy. That was um, A lot of this, though, is a, is a function, I think, of bad understanding of the faith. So we talked about all those enthusiastic young people wanting to do the right thing by their faith, but they're misdirected because they've they've been given an idea of what the faith is. You have to win this argument or you have to believe this perfectly, otherwise you can't do that. And there's even, standing for that principle matters more than yeah. engaging with them at a human level. Kind yeah, of. and there's some people who, who get mortally offended that someone else approached communion. This is almost the, you know, the the classic situation of Christ talking to the, the Pharisee and the tax collector. But, oh, that person went to communion and I know they're not living right. And you go, well, okay, what was happening in your heart when you were in that mass? Mm -hmm. like, as you're, you know, were you focused on Christ? Were you focused on your place before Christ and, and, the, and the grace he has for your life, for your um, sins, for your struggle to be that? Or were you worried, you know, you're so focused on someone else that you, and the purity of that, that you miss the whole point of the entire um, mass? That bad theology, I think, comes because it's, I'm going to get a bit controversial here and say it's easier. It's easier to boil everything down to one thing or a couple of things. It's easier to not have to think in vague, well, not vague, but a more complex system of thought. Um, what do you think? Is that, am I oversimplifying it there? No, I don't think so. What's right, what's coming to my mind is um, a gospel passage, and you're the scripture scholar, so you can you can tell me which one it is, Peter. You know, Catholics and the <laughs> Bible. You put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it's in there somewhere. <laughs> that's I right, know. That's I've right. heard it before. Well, it's um, when Christ, it struck me, it was, um, it was just this week. So Christ sends out the 12 apostles, and they're all named, mm -hmm. and he says, don't go out to the pagans, go to the Jews. Yes. And it struck me as a, I thought strategic operator. That was the first thing that clicked in my mind. But, <laughs> but I thought um, go to the people who kind of understand some of the language yes. and open it up and make it alive for them. Yes. And I think that that's actually part of the mission of um, of the church today or the believers today to actually reach those people who are hurting and wounded within the church to help to make communities um, yeah. alive with the love of Christ in and, whichever way that looks. And also in the Jewish community, one of the key factors of evangelization was that they were hopeful. They were looking yeah. for the Messiah. Yeah. They were already looking out for, whereas a lot of the Greeks didn't even know that they needed one. No, that's right. And yeah, so the Jews are actively alert and looking. And then if you hear, well, here he is. Mm. Um, that's, I think there are little ways in which we could probably do that a lot better yes. ourselves so that we become better witnesses and more joyful witnesses together. So we're not, that's one of the, one of the big scandals I find within the church, besides everything else that hits the headlines, is that there's so much lack of unity. Right. So Christ is calling us all to be one. Yep. I was looking at this with my students when looking, we're supposed to be like the unity of the Trinity, which is also a multiplicity. So why are we arguing about liturgy? 
why are we arguing about, you know, and that, that's something we could have a whole podcast about that, right? Mm-hmm. The different lay movements within the church, um, you know, well, our mind's better than yours or um, I'm not going to name any of them. You all know who. <laughs> we all know who we are. Um, and then you've got the mainstream Catholic who's just like, can't I just go to mass yes. and have a beautiful liturgy where my heart is rising to God and I'm, I'm with everyone else? Can't I just have an hour of that beautiful peace? Please yes. stop bringing your your turf war in, in warfare into into our liturgy. But you said that you said that's exactly the point because it's not just about us choosing those different groups. Often the different different ideas of church get forced upon us. Yeah. So you go to some parishes and you'll get a particular agenda coming through or a particular kind of thing coming at you as if this is the only way to be Catholic yeah. or as if we have to do that. And in, what you really need is peace with God. You That's need, right. You need a, a place to come and move away from the world, if you like, for that moment, and it should, it should be that other place, yeah. I'm going to throw in one here because, and probably you haven't had as much experience of this as I have. I used to work in Christian radio and I have to say one of the worst things for Christian image is Christian rock and roll. Um, okay. <laughs> Talk about giving love a bad name. Oh. This might need some, I don't know, I, I'm open because I, I, I'm interested because I'm actually a bit of a fan of the bit of the Christian rock and roll. Yeah, like, look, I have It favorites. depends on where and, and when and what context, but. Yeah, look, uh, I'm not talking about in the mass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm can I just say that very clearly? I'm <laughs> definitely not talking about it in mass, and I don't think, I don't think certain types of modern music work in mass precisely because of the nature of the music and what it's for. Hmm. Um, we can get into that in another cast, but the um, what I'm talking about is that often things get sold because they're Christian, and when the, the problem I have with modern Christian rock, and if you look at all the charts um, of Christian rock over the last, say, two decades. Almost all that is this prosperity doctrine. Everything's la la because I'm with Jesus. And what we need, I think, is more of the Alanis Morissette kind of um, the gritty. That's probably dating me there, really, isn't it? Or the journals want what, what is what if God was one of us? The kind of the, the U two searching anguished lyrics before they went all fluffy and sold it to us on iTunes. <laughs> the, yeah, basically, the 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 kind of the gritty life sucks. How, how do we wrestle with suffering? How do we actually deal with the, the Christian music seems, seems to be very upbeat and, and la la. And I find that when people talk about, oh, let's get modern music into parishes, they don't mean let's have a really doleful sort of song about suffering. They, they, they want to be upbeat and happy la la instead of um, something that's actually about substantial things. Well, two things I'll say about that very quickly. The first is that you can find them. I, I'll, I'll just name drop. I will name drop Matt Marr. Okay. Uh, I I think his music for, is 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 precisely what you yep. think it, it should be. Yep. I, I think I'd agree uh, with several that. people can re- meditate, have actual profound mental prayer based on the lyrics and and the way his songs are constructed. He's I the only guy I know be. who's written a song with transubstantiation in it. As the opening line, yeah. the end of the beginning is a great <laughs> album, and that's that's dating me. I actually went to the first Matt Marr concert in Australia. Right. It was at a parish hall in Ashfield, <laughs> right? And I'm not kidding. And there were not that many people local. there, but we were like, we were, we were going hard and, and, yep. there were, and there were chairs at the back with these old people just sitting there at the back <laughs> and, you know, and he was like, get up and oh, come to the front. And Australians, we're just like, no, we're, no, no, we're, we're just right, going to sit. Right, we're, we're okay. <laughs> but so, yeah, I think there, you can find it. Yep. Uh, I will, yeah. There's plenty of the, the the happy clappy kind of stuff out there, but you can sure. find within that genre some some music that you know that really can orient you towards a prayerful engagement. Yep. With, you know, with the transcendent. The second thing is uh, about your point to say that oh, we we need to get you know music into churches that are going to attract young people. No young person says that. Right. You will never find a young person, at least in my experience, who will say, yeah, we need to get rid of all the old stuff. No one likes this ancient, what's what's polyphony? What's Gregorian chant? Yep. No one wants yep. that. Get us the rock music. Like, I I think that's more, if I can label the, the baby boomer generation as one particular yes. culprit who says, we need, you know, this is what young people want. Like, mate, you have no idea yeah. what we want. Yeah, See, they my- don't actually <laughs> ask young no. people what they want. And where are young people going in Sydney, at least? Yeah. They're going to where there is beautiful traditional music. Absolutely. So that, that's where you will find young people See, today. My kids are into the chart music, right? They're, they're, Unfortunately, and I'm constantly <laughs> having this discussion with them about quality of music and the and the variance and uh, and composition. But when they when I took them to our present church, w- the building, the architecture, the beautiful liturgy, every, it's very very. I mean, it's it's Novus Ordo. It's the, the the new mass, but it's very well done. So just Novus Ordo means it's in English. It's not in Latin. That's right. Yeah. Confusing. It's it the Latin mass. Sorry, is in Latin. Yeah, but, but we talk about the fact It doesn't necessarily mean English. It's in the vernacular in uh, Latin. So well, Novus Ordo just means new order because it's actually in Latin 
if we do it the right way, but mostly it's in English these days. Yeah, that's right. This is just for anyone who's wondering what on earth we're talking about right now. <laughs> it means we're not into the, we're not talking about the old rice. Yeah, yet. that's right. So basically it's the, it's the current mass but really done beautifully and they all loved it. And I said, well, hang on, you don't like the other music? And they're saying, well, we come to church. This There's is, a this time is church. and a place for this music. Yeah. yeah. And they would still. I mean, I think they they do enjoy Matt Maher. In fact, we use his CDs. We use another guy called Toby Mac and oh, yeah. DC Talk before that. Um, I love them. They're well produced. They're really hard hitting. They actually, I'd like to quote a Toby Mac song, a DC Talk song, actually at the end of this. Um, they quote Bernard Banning saying, uh, "The actually I'll do it now." They quote Bernard Banning who said, "The the greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who." acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then deny him, walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and when someone's prepared to actually sort of wrestle with that problem, and this, that's the beginning of a song of um, DC Talks called What If I Stumble? So they're not blaming other people for messing up the Christian thing. They're saying, what, what happens when I mess up? What happens when I destroy a relationship or when I, through my zealousness or just being a, a, a an idiot, um, mess people's impression of a church. How do I actually deal with that? Well, I think it comes down to the local level though, doesn't it? I mean, the way we combat people who've had bad experiences or had bad impressions from the world is that we give them another experience. Yeah, totally. A different yeah, experience. And you, your example of the joyful, um, you know, water cooler chat mm. is exactly what we're talking about. Um, and I think Renee's had lots of experience with this when we're talking with people who aren't religious at all, when they're in the classroom and they realize, hey, we're interested in engaging with all ideas openly mm. and, and vigorously and and not just saying you have to believe this, but we're actually exploring the ideas. And this is a respectful exchange of ideas. They really get into that and they yeah. start respecting it much more. Yeah. Would you say that's the... Yeah, I think that that's true. Hmm. Well, so pretty much it stops with us. The only way we're going to change it is actually be be the change. Well, that's my yeah, that's totally my attitude. One particular scriptural image that I like reflecting on a lot of the time is again, I'm going to be the guy that can't actually reference where it is in scripture, <laughs> but it's the it's the the story where uh the two men are standing before the temple, one is the uh, I think the Pharisee and the other is just the humble tax, tax collector. collector. Yep. And yeah, the Pharisee is, you know, dressed beautifully and the tax collectors uh, I imagine him as being quite you know, interiorly at least, but an artist would probably capture him as being filthy or, or something mm, like he's that. He's probably well dressed because he's very rich. He is probably. That's how it's just actually, spiritually. Spiritually, he's, though. Yeah. Uh, and I kind of read my life as a tension between those two right. personalities. Yep. You know, I'm trying to be like the tax collector in mm. spirit, but I find myself a lot of the time more like you know, the Pharisee and declaring, well, yes. aren't I fantastic? This is exactly what I was talking about before. The, the, the words of the Pharisee in that, in that one are, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the word the Pharisee literally says in his prayer, have mm. mercy on me, a mm. sinner. Whereas the words of the, that was a tax collector. Yeah. The words of the Pharisee are, um, I thank God that I am not like other men, like, like this him. tax collector. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that guy. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and so... And this is why in the liturgy, the very one of the very first things we come across is, Lord, have mercy. Mm. And it's the cry of a beggar that we come before God as as the the beggar who says, all right, I'm the problem here. I'm I'm the first problem to solve. And we talked about Mother Teresa before. Um, Mother Teresa, when she was asked, what's the problem with the church? She said, me. Now, yeah, she also said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Yes. Mm. So that's a, I think that that's a really important thing yeah. too. A lot of people can actually forget about how important that family life is. And I think anyone who's leading a professional life really needs to realize that yeah. as yeah. well, that sometimes we can get so caught up in our work that we're actually forgetting the most important Mayor work, Cooper, if you like. Mayor yeah, Cooper. you're well. <laughs> <Mayor> Maxim <Cooper>. <laughs> <laughs> We work together. We're, you know, cut from the same cloth in that respect. So that, that, that tendency to want to go out and change the world I needs to be really balanced, counterbalanced with just really loving one's family and, yep. and working on what's going on there. When I was in ministry, I, the Lutheran minister, a, a parishioner took me aside, a very old and wise lady, and she said, uh, Pastor, what if God had told me that there were just two people in the world that I should uh, evangelize? What if he'd clearly told me two people, and, but I'm distracted by all the other good things I could do? I said, well, if God's telling you to, to evangelize those two people, you should go and do it. And she said, go home and play with your children. And she mm. said, you're doing all these good things, but you have children at home and they need you. Yeah. And she, oh, it 
bang right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, it was such a – it's one of the reasons, by the way, I'm against um, married clergy is because I've experienced it myself and literally you you have two brides. You have the church and you have the your own family and you can't give them yourself completely, either one, and you end up doing a bad job of one or both, usually both. We are getting to the end of our discussion. Um, unless you wanted to add anything more to that? No, no, it's good. It's, yeah, it's, we're not so eager to talk about bad things, are we? <laughs> <laughs> Too joyful. To yeah. That's right. It's time to wrap up. So at this time we're going to talk about something a bit more positive, um, something which has uh, just made us wonder. We call this segment One Minute Wonder where we talk about something in life which has made us stop and smile or, or think – uh, or just wonder about um, what God's given us. So let's start with our guest, Cormac. Sure. My uh, one minute wonder for today actually really beautifully ties into how you just finished that point about going home and loving your family. I had a really interesting insight. You could call it perhaps a moment of divine inspiration. I don't know. But uh, I have, so I have two boys with our third child, you know, due in a couple of weeks. So it's a very exciting time. But Patrick, who's my eldest, uh, it's a totally new experience. Every time he's, you know, uh, the next month he's doing different things. And so it's like, oh, I've got. <laughs> How old is he? Uh, he's turning three in a few weeks. Right. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a chaotic kind of yep. process, but he's such a dutiful, reasonable toddler. It's incredible. Wow. Like, and he's such an. I don't think I've heard those words in the same sentence. Child. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And he's, and he's Must really, he's really rules oriented. Like he, he right. gets it and, he, and he's, he's so obedient, I think. <laughs> and so when I engage with him and he's doing something, he's mucking up and I go, Oh, Patrick, you know, maybe let's not do that. Let's do something else. Or you've hurt your brother. Can you say sorry? And when he, um, you know, I, I just want him to, I want to, look after him and I'm giving him these boundaries because I know that that's good for him. I'm a yep. father looking out for him and saying, look, you want to do this, but I'm putting that limit there to protect you. Yeah. And then when he turns around and says, yes, daddy, I'm sorry, I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I'll do better next time almost is what he pretty much says. Uh, my heart just pours out with affection <laughs> for him. And I just want, how, how much more do I just want to look after him and, and, you know, and, and hold him close? And I just, it just hit me there. That must be how God looks at us. Oh, wow. That mm. when I'm obedient yep. to God, you know, he, he or, or rather I'll start with when I'm disobedient, yep. he still loves me and he wants, he's putting safeguards in place to look after me. Yep. When I am obedient, how much must his heart pour out with affection. But you just point out there, it's not just the slavish uh, adherence to a particular rule. What you're seeing in your son there is is something coming from his heart. That's right. Yeah, where his heart aligns with the ideals and stuff you're talking about. And mm. that's when you, yeah. So uh, obedience is, is, sorry, I'm being a technical here. <laughs> obedience is not just slavish, a bit like, adherence to a particular set of rules, but it's when their hearts align with what we're... It's precisely right. I don't, I'm not doing it because he's listened to me. Yes. It's, it's, um, it's more of an orientation of himself to say, yep, you've aligned with the That's vision right. that I have for your good. Yeah. And you are living that and embodying yeah. that. And so, yeah, I just... Cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Cool. That was slightly more than a minute, but uh, Renee, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> it's fine. It was a good story. It's your first time. You're never welcome yeah. again. <laughs> <laughs> One minute... Well, this week I have been putting together lots of stuff for um, for teachers who will be teaching high school students about yep. Catholic thought. And I'm a philosopher, and I always say, I always joke, and I say I have to get myself a t-shirt t-shirt that says I am not a theologian because often I get asked <laughs> theology <laughs> questions. But actually, I've had to read a lot into theology these days, so I'm starting to question whether the t-shirt is now okay or not. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I've been looking at the Trinity. <laughs> so that is a cause a for wonder. Start. It's a really cause for wonder. And trying to give visual aids to teachers who will be teaching high school students, I looked really seriously at Rublev's icon of the Trinity. Oh, yeah. And just so much opened up and I just found so much about the geometry of, of the whole piece. Um, but just the, the beautiful way in which Rublev was taking something from the book of Genesis, so with Abraham and from the book of John and talking about unity and multiplicity. And that has really struck me a lot um, as something that as a church I think we need to be far more serious about okay. realising in our everyday lives. So it's amazing how much the Trinity actually has bearing on everything we do. Yeah, so yeah. I wonder if that, that image is out of copyright so we can 
put a cop like well, a I link found to a it. Wikimedia uh, <laughs> public domain kind of thing. Well, if it's public so. domain, we could probably put it in the show notes. Yeah. So that'd be mm. worth uh, worth following up. My one minute wonder was that I got the opportunity to ride in my normal regular train ride to work, but my children were on their way to a ferry ride. So three of my children, I've got to be careful. Yeah, three of my children came with four of my children came with losing track uh, <laughs> on the train and my wife was with us and but I sat next to my youngest daughter and just her sheer joy and wonder at all the things I look at every day with that bland kind of love <laughs> on my way to work and she was wow look at that what's that what's that bit and and I just it's now changed my oh, on the way here this morning I was looking at all the things going oh, I'll tell her more about ah. that tomorrow it's just changed my perception and kids do that for you you start yeah. seeing the whole world in a different way that reminds me of in um, Fides et Ratio when John Paul II talks about the importance of wonder and how we can fall into deadening routine if we don't constantly keep that sense of wonder mm. alive yeah, so, yeah there you go. I'm reading a book still reading a book it's a very short one but I'm taking a long time it's called The Theology of Wonder it's based on G.K. Chesterton's look at the world so we'll have ah, to come back to that yeah. sometime yeah totally I'd be interested yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent <you'll> have me. <laughs> that's it for this week's podcast if today's discussion got you thinking or arguing with us or you think we missed something um, let us know you can subscribe to our podcast at our website, thiscatholiclife.com.au, and tell us what you liked or what you didn't like and what you'd like us to discuss in future. You can drop us a line at info at thiscatholiclife.com.au, or you can continue the conversation by joining our Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, or any of the other regular social medias. The links are all on the, in the show notes and on our website. If you like the podcast, be sure to write us a review on iTunes. Remember, you have to sign in these days into iTunes Player and then leave the review. This helps other people who are looking for similar things to find us and also helps us, obviously, if you give us feedback. Uh, this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast, and we think that's a great idea, and we think it's a, an idea worth getting behind. So tell your friends about it. But before we go, it's time for shout-outs. Does, is there anyone you wanted to say hi to, Cormac? Oh, James Tedesco, if he's listening, to say thanks for getting the blues home in state of origin. <laughs> oh, so the impressed. blues being uh, the blues being New South Wales New in South state Wales. of origin. There you so, go. There yeah. you go. I was there watching it, and I'm told it was an awesome match, and I could see the scoreline was quite tight, but I, I won't pretend to have understood much of it. <laughs> so. Renee. I have no idea what you guys were just talking about, but I'd like to send a, <laughs> a shout out to all of the wonderful people who work in a really quiet way to help the vulnerable within our church. So I'm constantly amazed, especially around wintertime at all of the Vinnie's appeals that go out and just um, just all of that wonderful, very quiet work, that which does not reach the headlines of the newspapers. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of people who do that work wouldn't want that to be the case, but I admire them greatly and um, shout out to them they're listening yeah i'd like to shout out to the catholic parents i've had an opportunity to speak to recently the, but they're all trying their hardest to do a good job of being parents and it's it's a tough gig and usually they think they're doing a bad job which probably means they've actually got a good attitude and they're thinking about the hard things mm. but you're actually doing much better than you think um, keep up the hard work and basically you can only do as much as you have the capacity to do keep trying that's all for this week. Next week, we're going to discuss how difficult it is to find true love as a Catholic. We'll hear from the author of For Want of a Lot of Good Men, the article in the Catholic Weekly, which exploded with interest and lots of responses to that. We'll discuss the amazing reaction to that article and more. That's all for now. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life. <music>